I got up uh, feeling much calmer, and then security guards started to come in. And I interpreted these security guards as angels that were somehow bringing me to heaven. So I was eager to work with people. I wasn't fighting anybody off. Uh, and they told me to come with them, and I did. But then when we got to the door of the ballroom, I refused to take my shirt or put my shirt back on. I just refused to do it. I thought if I'm going to meet God somehow, I go as we were brought into this world. I wasn't ashamed of my body and, uh, and I was going to leave without my shirt. And this was not acceptable to them. So then they started to bring in people from the Landmark Forum and uh, the people who were running the course. And I started to really get a sense of who is good to work with, who could I trust, who could I love, and who was just trying to manipulate me and scare me, and who were trying to be the authoritative figures. And I responded very much more to love than I did to this controlling uh, aspect. And they brought people in telling me things very bad were going to happen to me, and I needed to, uh, you know, put my clothes on. and. When one woman came in, uh, the leader of the course, and told me that I needed to put my clothes on, I took my pants off, and so now I was in my underwear. And uh, they really didn't know what to do with me. I was still looking for a way to get to heaven. I don't know which way I needed to go. Uh, they brought my father in as he was there, and, and he asked me to think about my mother and what this would do to her. And it hit me very strongly that, that, that this would be very disturbing for her, but then I needed to sit with that fear and think about that I was going through an illusion, that this was a test to go to heaven, and I needed to let that go, and I needed to be prepared to even let my own family go, which I was. Sadly enough, I, I, I was prepared to let that go in order to move on in, in the, to the next level. Well, I don't know how long it took, but eventually two police officers arrived and they gave me a choice of a psychiatric institution or jail. And I told them that I was choosing peace. I had seen light switches on the wall and because this was all an illusion to me in some way, I thought that maybe by turning off the light switches, I would be annihilating myself in a sort of an, another death process and moving on to the next level. So when they told me that they had to take me to one of these places, I moved for the light switches and went to turn them off. And with that, it was a kind of a, a surrender to God, a suicide in a sense of giving up my own body, even though I knew that I would continue living in another level. Uh, but before I got to the light switches, the police grabbed me and got me on the ground. And I've still got the scars on my shoulder from the carpet burns. Uh, they put me in the uh, stretcher. And we were in the elevator going to the floor where the ambulance was. And uh, I still remember thinking that, my God, this is the craziest way to get to heaven that I ever could have imagined. I, I still thought that this was the way to go to heaven. And I thought it was quite hilarious, to be quite honest. Uh, but once I had those handcuffs on, it felt quite interesting. Because when I had signed up for the Landmark Forum and they asked me, why was I taking this course? Uh, my response was that I felt handcuffed in my life. It was as if I couldn't move for four years of my career. And I had always been a very intelligent person. Uh, went to university, got high grades, no problems. And then all of a sudden, getting into my career, I was just stuck all the time. And no matter what I did, it seemed like I was always stuck. Uh, handcuffed. And so now here I am feeling completely free, completely at ease with everything going on around me, and I'm handcuffed and in a, host and in a um, stretcher in this ambulance. Well, once they took me, uh, two very nice police officers, by the way, took me to the uh, hospital. They asked me to be quiet, and I guess because they had restrained me, my arms and legs to the bed, it felt like my voice was my only weapon or my only way to connect with people. And I really wanted people around me, and they kept isolating me. And so I would yell for them, and I would yell to people, and I wanted some attention, and, and they kept isolating me. I don't know why. Um, 
And then uh, I guess the psychiatrist came in and I was really in need of connection and human contact and trust and love, all of these things. And he sat down in his chair with his little clipboard and uh, he said to me, what happened? And I told him, I said, look, I don't really want to talk to a doctor. I want to talk to a person. What's your name? And he said, uh, my name is Dr. Chin. And I told him, I said, well, what's, my, what's your first name? And he said, my name is Dr. Chin. And right away I knew I was dealing with someone who wasn't going to give me what I needed. Um, so I started calling him F because on his little badge I could see it was Dr. F. Chin. I'd call him F. And even though I knew he wasn't going to listen to a word that I said, that he wasn't going to believe anything I said, I thought, what the hell, I'll just tell him my story. I've gone this far, maybe this is another test. And I started to tell him how I was having this mystic experience with God and that I was opening myself to the world and that I've died and blah, 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 blah. And I figured, who knows what's going to happen after this. Well, uh, my father stayed with me a while and, and he touched my back, which was something that I really appreciated, having that touch there. And my mother came in and I was very happy to see her and my uh, sister-in-law, and then seeing all these people come back, people that I thought I was never going to see again because I was going to heaven. I was quite happy. I was very excited. And I even thought my friends from Vancouver were going to be there too. Uh, so, you know, comments like this made people think that I was just nuts, which maybe I was. Um, but I wouldn't shut up. And uh, I wanted to talk, and at one point I got the feeling that the staff couldn't even hear me. And I was screaming at them. I was like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And, and thinking that maybe they were deaf. I don't know. I was in a weird world, right? And uh, they came in at one point, six of them, and, uh, and then they had this needle. And I didn't know what that needle was going to do to me, but I knew that what I was going through was very sacred and that that needed to be respected. And I told the doctor repeatedly, I do not want that needle. I do not want that needle. And then I decided to negotiate and I said to him, look, if you take that needle away, I'll calm down. I will calm down. I won't say anything. Can you do that? And he said, okay. And I laid down. I calmed myself down and I got down in the bed. I laid down flat. I laid down calm. And then the entire staff put their hands on me and they went to stick the needle in. And I was furious, and I said some things to the nurse who had the needle, and to the doctor, that I won't mention in this video, but it was pretty vulgar, and it was, it was, I was just, it was rape to me. What they did to me in that hospital uh, with the needle was a form of rape. It was a spiritual rape. Um, and I told that doctor, I said, how can I trust you after you do something like this? And for me, after that, he was nothing. He was dead to me. And I told him, I said, fine, if you want to stick that needle in, go ahead, but it won't do anything. And they did. They stuck it in. Then they left me. I guess that made them feel better. They should have gave themselves the tranquilizer.